Good evening and welcome to Legal Tech Live. I am your host, Nick Richwain. We've got a guest here tonight from across the pond. I'm excited for it. He stayed up or woke up late in order to be here because of the time zone differences. So Callum Murray is the CEO and co-founder of Amicus, uh, and they have a wide variety of services for essentially it's a, an award-winning company, tech company for good. They have this story, and I want to read this briefly, Callum. Uh, In 2008, you uh, were looking for legal and financial support for a business that you had, uh, but finding and accessing that support was complex, time-consuming, and expensive. Uh, And that sounds, that's like in your company story, on your site. That seems to be the impetus. Welcome to the show, Callum Murray, and tell us what amicus did tell us a little bit about your background and tell us what amicus does thanks nick yeah thanks for having me and i hope your uh listeners you know understand what i'm gonna say we Uh, can you can good yep loud and clear the yeah the backstory came from really the fact that i was going through the court process to try and solve a problem and that never worked out very well. So yeah, it's expensive. I was a small business. I was due some money. I thought I could go to court and get that money back. Um, the, the contracts that we were going through at the time were due to the financial crash, like 2007, 2008. And we were due a bunch of money from lots of different subcontractors. And then after experiencing the civil process, figured that all of the things you mentioned, time consuming, complex, expensive, that's the same the world over. And as a small business, you don't have much chance. Like you, you kind of, you're up against it. So I figured there must be a better way. And if there was going to be a better way, who was going to create that? Was it going to be the attorneys, the lawyers? Was it going to be the courts? I didn't think that was going to happen. So... (laughs) I you didn't see that. You didn't see that they were incentivized to do that. Nah, it didn't look like the incentives uh, were going to line up. So I thought, let's just go and set something up. First off, learn a lot more about why it was challenging for me. Um, and, you know, I'm coming from a relative position of privilege, and I found it really hard. So if that was the case for me, surely I could go out and figure things out do what I needed to do, set up a business and make it easier for other people. That was the, the kind of genesis of it. Okay. And from that, uh, and we were put in contact by Joshua Lennon, as I, as I recall on Twitter, Yeah, uh, Joshua Lennon from Clio, because I was looking for somebody uh, in the anti-money laundering, know your customer kind of experience, which is part of what Amicus does, but Amicus really has a suite of tools. Uh, so, can you give us kind of an overall? Uh, I do want to touch on those topics, but mm-hmm. as I as I was digging in before before the interview, I thought, oh, that you know, they really do a wide variety uh, of things that kind of are supported by by your inspiration to make things easier. So, what what does Amicus do? Well, uh, the f- generally. Yeah, the first, the generally, uh, the the stuff we do is help law firms or lawyers of lots of different size and type change the way that they work and do things digitally. So how can we help them be more efficient, do more, do that online? Um, as part of that, we, we plugged into Clio maybe like, I don't know, three or four years ago. Um, we integrated with them as they were moving over to the EU. And the the money laundering challenge is really big over here. It's something that's been around now for quite some time. It's like laborious. It's quite complex. And it, it can be a challenge, especially so for smaller firms who might not have, you know, dedicated risk teams and complex systems in place. So that was the link between um, us and Clio. So we've had that for quite some time. The first thing that we actually set out to do was to build out a link between case law and legislation so how could you as a business owner understand or triage your scenario and figure out what you should do next should you talk to a solicitor was mediation a route 
should you be going to arbitration? And those were the questions that I had in my mind when I just defaulted and went to court. So the first thing that we did was we went off and built effectively a search tool, and that mm-hmm. was using user-based input to then cluster case law against legislation. And I spent a year looking into commercializing machine learning in the legal sector through the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is effectively like an academic program that I got a fellowship on. So I was based at Edinburgh University. Um, we, we ran then a pilot program with a couple of other universities to look at how we might do that. So we built out a beta and then we realized that the IP around this was a bit of a hot mess. Mm-hmm. It's, really, <laughs> it's really challenging. I know um, it's pretty difficult regardless of wherever you are in the world, you know, sure. accessing, yeah. you know, court information, case law, judgments, all of that stuff is pretty complicated. So once we built that, we realized it was going to be a big uphill battle. And we we had engaged with lots of different people at the time. And then realized, you know what, we should just put this on pause because it's going to be a huge cash sink. um, And we're going to have to start generating revenue, solve a problem. So when we engaged with the market, what we found from these law firms we were talking to was actually the problem upstream was around the acquisition of new clients. And how could you do that? in an efficient way. And if we were going to build out online tools to help people to navigate and find and triage legal problems online, you would for certain have to know who that person would be. Is there a fraud risk? What is the money laundering risk? Um, So we thought, oh, we're really easy. We'll build this in like six months. And that was about five years ago. (laughs) So yeah, it got it got a bit more complicated, and you know things change when you start to add in people and expectations of investors, and uh, you know get a product to market. So, um, that was the the flip point, like when or the the pivot when we went from search um, and the clustering of the the information and how you would figure that out. That all exists, like all of that stuff is still there. It's just parked up. It's sitting on um, Amazon, like sitting on AWS, just like as a little beta thing. And we'll go back to that. Like we'll get yeah. there. Um, but with the the onboarding and the money laundering, what well, that's led into, there's two aspects to it. On one hand, who is the staff member that you are about to engage with? Are they fit and proper to practice? Um, in the UK, there's, there's various different bits of legislation around this. The most recent is it's called R26. It's the 26 regulation as part of some new guidance that's come out from the legal sector affinity group, which is this body that comes out and talks about regulation. So from there, you need to check out anyone who's a beneficial owner, officer, or manager at a law firm. So you uh-huh. need to do the staff check. So that's like criminal record checks and that type of stuff. Okay. And but what we would a, call a background check here. In yeah, the exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Vetting or background checks, exactly that. And we've plugged into various different sources all via API and made that really simple and straightforward for someone to do, make it really quick. And then on the other side for the staff, or sorry, for the client perspective, that's not something that's maybe as big in in North America right now yet. I know there's some stuff going through the Senate and there's some discussions about it and the American Bar Association have a view on that. But in the EU, all of this has been pushed for maybe five or more years. It's, you know, we're on like the fifth or the sixth amendment um, of or say of the money laundering directives. So they keep getting updated from the EU and then taken into country legislation or, you know, directives and um, effectively, from a practical level, law firms need to comply with this stuff. That you know, it's it's criminal types outcomes if you don't and you get caught up in it. So there's a big onus for firms to comply, which is around who is you know know your client or know your customer, peps and sanctions. Is the person politically exposed? Is there any adverse media there? Um, have you run a firm wide risk assessment? So there's quite a lot that falls into this and that's that's really where we've been able to 
deliver a lot of value to a lot of different law firms, whether it's in, you know, real estate, that's mm-hmm. like a, a big area because of the, the speed that you need to move at, the transactions going on, it's fairly high value, the risk can be high. So that's an area that we initially kind of went in on and then recognized that what we've done within the legal profession really just built trust with the, the regulator here in Law Society in Scotland or the SRA in England and Wales, just to develop relationships there to become a trusted provider. And from that, we've then moved into other sectors. So we work with you know wealth management and the financial services. We've got contracts with government and the, in the UK, the NHS, who manage health and social care. So we've been able to take the trust that we've built in the legal profession and deliver that platform out into many other areas. But our, you know, our core business is in the legal profession. That's uh, it's fascinating. So the uh, legal profession in the UK, and I'm 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 a novice with what's happening there, but. You know, we talk about the regulations regularly in the U.S., but there are significant regulations on the legal practice in the U.K. that I was unaware of that you just took me through. So I, I want to break that down a little bit for our listeners to, as to what Amicus does in that situation. So if I'm a client, I'm looking to buy, uh, I'm U.S.-based, uh, I, I want to go to uh, Scotland and, and buy a piece of property, but I want to do this remotely, right, because I'm in the U.S., uh, do in and, and I go to one of the law firms that uses Amicus. What mm-hmm. what is the process then? They have to verify uh, my identity or authenticate me somehow. Yeah. So let's imagine you're going to move to the Royal Mail in Edinburgh and have a nice view of the castle. That would be great. You'll maybe spend I don't know three hundred thousand bucks or something. Get yourself a nice one bedroom flat. <laughs> Uh, and it's a if, it's that's a little low for me yeah, it's a little low okay, for me you know, Callum. Yeah, I, I, get I expect it, I get a little bit uh, something a little okay. bit more but uh, i'll we'll take it we'll take it okay um so if you're going to do that you, you find a law firm here and the first thing they'll be doing is is say right we're going to internally run a risk assessment against nick okay who is nick what's the deal here okay, he's going to come and buy a property and he's going to be buying it in cash or you're going to buy, a, you know, use a mortgage to do that. Okay, mm-hmm. that sounds fine. What will happen is like when you're engaging with the solicitor at that point, they would be sending you a short link to say, hey, Nick, we've got money laundering obligations to meet. And from that short link in the email, it would be branded up as that firm. You would click into that, you would take a selfie, you would take or a short video, you would take an image of your passport or a driving license. You would then from that, we would scrape the information off it and then go, go away and check that. You would complete a, a you know previous address history check. So something that you might be familiar with in, in the US, like there's a bunch of uh, companies who do that stuff. And um, once that's done, you'd look at are you politically exposed? Are you on any sanctions lists? Is there any adverse media that relates to you? Um, and following that, you would complete a source of funds and a source of wealth check. So that would be looking at your bank account. So um, open banking is a bit of tech or like the underlying tech that's pretty well adopted now across the UK. It's not so much in, in the US. Maybe it's coming. It's in across Australia and a few other places. But what that allows you to do is log into your bank and share transaction data to say, uh-huh. yep, here's where my transaction data is coming from. The alternative would be, you know, provide bank statements or a utility bill to, to evidence what's going on from a financial perspective. Um, you might be asked a few follow-up questions if there's anything that raises a red flag. And once that's done, you know, it's all instantaneous, really simple. Uh, you would then hear back from the attorney and they'd say, yep, Nick, everything's checked out. Hey, we're good to go. But ahead of them doing any work or actually engaging with you, you know, you'll get your engagement letter and they'll explain mm-hmm. to you all of that, but they won't actually do anything until you've passed those checks. Interesting. Um, That's fascinating. I did not, uh, I did not realize that that was, it was that, uh, but you say this is instantaneous. Like what you just, the, what you just described to me, I thought, 
boy, it's going to take me an hour to fill out all these, uh, all this paperwork or maybe more than an hour. I don't know how I go having to go back and look at old addresses. I'd have to think about that. Uh, but is how long does something like that usually take in a, in a situation where I don't have any red flags? Yeah, it's a matter of minutes, like to actually click through, you can do, it's all web enabled. So you can do it on a tablet, you can do it on a mobile phone. We process maybe about 30,000 um, a month, something like that. At the moment, the, the volume, obviously, as new people come in, it continues to grow. But um, from a UI perspective, like the interface and the experience for you is really simple. So it's built out against a government standard, which is around web accessibility. So regardless of your background or your you know level of ability, it's really simple for you to navigate through that. You're not going to hit a dead end. <laughs> Um, so when, when you actually go through, it's really simple, but the old process would be, oh, hey, Nick, you need to come in and get your documents notarized, or hey, Nick, you need to go and see a solicitor in our you know, group that we belong to that exists internationally and go downtown to wherever and take all your documents in. They'll be scanned. They'll then typically would be attached in a plain text email and sent around. So all of that's gone now. And what we provide is this secure, centralized approach where you can manage that and it's all encrypted and safe and you can be really clear as to what's going on. We don't sell the data, data goes nowhere. It's cross-checked and corroborated by whether it's Experia and Equifax, TransUnion. There's different aspects that that will happen, but we don't do anything with your stuff. We're not doing anything else. We're not selling it to anyone else. We're not up to anything daft with it. It's um, purely for the fact that you need to be able to do this in a really simple way. And from, for all of our clients, um, it's all usage-based. So the more they use, the more value we can give them, um, the better for everyone involved, really. Yeah, that's fantastic. And what what is the... It, it, it's, it's fascinating to me that these requirements, what is the big concern? Uh, you, you talk about political expose and... Is it because uh, the UK and Scotland and the UK generally are are kind of major transport hubs for people coming from all over the world and visiting there and maybe trying to hide money there or hide? Is this is that is it known for that? Is the UK known for that that I'm un, that I was unaware of? I mean, I've heard about obviously Switzerland and those types mm-hmm. of things, but. Or, or is this more human rights related protection that they're, why do they need this kind of information? Why, uh, why is the UK so strict on this kind of information uh, for yeah. knowing the customer anti-money laundering? Yeah, it's, it's really EU wide, so across, across Europe and it, it comes or stems from really a trillion dollar problem. Like the problem of money laundering that you might think of it as, you know, there was a movie, I think it was Meryl Streep was in it, and she was in Panama, and, you know, there were there's the Panama Papers, and there's been a bunch right. of, like, media around that. Yes. But actually, it's not, like, big bin bags full of used dollar bills or, you know, someone turning up in Miami off a boat, like, with, you know, huge hauls of cash. But serious and organized crime and terrorism are, are funded through the laundering of money, so... You know, it could be something simple like a nail bar or any kind of cash business that it's really easy to filter money through and get it into the banking system. So there's been maybe a bit more media exposure of late around money laundering, which, you know, the consequences are human trafficking, child sex exploitation, drug, you know, trafficking. There's all sorts of stuff that's a, a result of or linked to money laundering. So it's taken from a view, like from a risk perspective, there's a, an organization called FATCA that, or FATF, that they look at lots of just jurisdictions to say, what's the risk look like in different countries? And they assign that. So then within the UK, they've taken the approach that a way into the system and a way into the banking system is through transactions with solicitors or attorneys, as well as your accountant. So they've put quite a lot of pressure on professional services to make sure that they're not a soft target mm. and there's there's other areas like gambling and other things that you might think or associate with the use of like where you might try and launder money 
So the intention with the regulations is to close that loop so that the regulators across the UK have all got together and they've agreed you know, a set of guidance, which means regardless who your regulator is, like where you are exactly, you've now got a really robust approach that you need to follow. So that's the kind of background to it. And effectively, we're keeping an eye on what's going to happen in the US and thinking about how that might affect um, attorneys. And I know, like I mentioned, the, the Bar Association, um, oh, I'm sure they'll be lobbying against that. And there's some work going on, I think, through the Senate at the moment around money laundering. So it's definitely a hot topic. Um, but the, the obligation isn't right now on the attorney in the US or Canada. Um, but what, what's happening in the UK, I think people have just got used to it. So mm -hmm. part of it was like, you know, having that awkward conversation with your new client to be like, hey, yeah, we're going to work together, but uh, are you really who you say you are? Uh, can, you need to prove it. And then when it comes to, oh, yeah, we're going to do deal with a trust or we're dealing with some private client matter. Oh, yeah, by the way, I need to see your bank account. Um, so in the past, that's maybe been an awkward conversation, but by pushing that onto a, a piece of software, it, it maybe makes it less awkward to say, yeah, just do this. It won't take you too long. Yeah, it, it becomes more like uh, a lot of the experience we've gone through applying for a loan or yeah. or uh, applying for yeah or applying for college or something like that. It feels familiar that way. Yeah, yeah same stuff. Yeah. And now you do this as well. Uh, interestingly, that you you talked about this uh, happening with pre-employment checks as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, what is the what what is the background on that? What is this because lawyers uh, have this fiduciary duty around handling money and transactions and things like that? So everybody who works in the law firm has to have this background check, or what? What is the what is the that role? Uh, that you play yeah so the background check part is linked to the money laundering regulations as well so the idea there is that if you're going to be in a senior position in a law firm you need to effectively be fit to practice and your regulator whether that's in scotland the law society or in england and wales the sra you need to then periodically prove that you don't have any criminal convictions because you're in that you know position of authority there's been a, a recent change which is now also around the frontline staff so if you're a paralegal or you're actually dealing with the onboarding of clients you're now obliged to do that stuff too so potentially the risk there being someone who's been placed into a law firm who maybe has links with organized crime or you know they might turn a blind eye or there's something going on there with potential bribery or corruption so now there's there's a, a bit in the, the regs that say you should really be doing this type of stuff for people who are on the front line as well and there's a big push around training too so if you're going to manage this stuff you need to understand what are the red flags like what are the risks so the example would obviously be if you went into a bank with you know a hundred thousand dollars the people on the cash desk are going to say, ah, hey, Nick, where'd you get your $100,000? And you're like, oh, yeah, I run this podcast and I get loads of ad, ad <laughs> revenue. Right. And, I'm, and what are you doing with that money? Oh, well, actually, I'm going to go and buy um, a property in the Royal Mail in Edinburgh. And they'll be like, okay, sure. And underneath the desk, they're like pressing the red button <laughs> right, to like, right. go and get their manager. <laughs> right, right. All right, folks, I see you out there on the Facebook feed. Uh, if you have questions, our guest tonight is Callum Murray. Uh, CEO and founder of Amicus. So put those questions in. We'll get them answered live. Uh, and uh, I was I was looking also at your you do identity checking uh, is which I'm thinking the anti money laundering pre employment checking uh, and identity checking is all all included. Is there a reason you just do an identity check only for something, or is it is that uh, kind of included in in the the other options that you that you offer or the other features that you offer? Yeah, there's a whole heap of stuff that we do, and it will really depend on the the level of risk that's involved. So, for example, you might be fairly low risk, and you've run a risk assessment, so built into the product got you know custom forms that you can build out to collect information and um, manage that on the way through 
And if actually you've got a prior relationship with the individual and you've maybe worked with them previously, you could just run a, an identity check. And that idea is from like TransUnion or Equifax, where you're looking at your address history and it will look back to like share information around, you know, credit cards and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that would be like a fairly low level type of check. You could go further up the, the chain and then start to look at your identity documents in more detail and make sure that, you know, they're not compromised, they've not been tampered with. The person who's on that isn't someone who's a known fraudster, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a bunch of different layers that you can add to that, depending on the type of situation or, or the transaction that you're involved with. Okay. So the, it, what, what I don't know what you see on the back end of this, but I have to ask. <laughs> I have to ask, have, have you gotten people who have not passed and then you were able to see why they didn't pass or do you not see that information and have you seen like uh that we got a war criminal here or something <laughs> have, have you been blown away by some of the people who have not passed some of these checks it, it happens from time to time it's very very rare that something yeah. will come up and how the the system's configured that is encrypted uh, end to end like we don't see that stuff okay it's so it's set up on the an account perspective so we use zendesk as a ticketing software so you know we get maybe like 0.1 percent of any check run and you know over a 90 day period anyone will come to us to say oh hey i'm stuck or i need help but um from time to time and this one example came up but it was maybe a i don't know now a couple of years ago and one of the law firms who we service or support with the software they got in touch through the ticketing software to the support team to say hey um i think you've had a false positive can you take a look at it so they can choose to open up the account from their side so if they do that mm. it will then start logging actions and you know who viewed what so sure uh, they switched that on and someone in the support team went in to have a look and then that got escalated through various people and then said okay can we when you have a chat, like, let's have a look. And it turned out it was someone who had previously been in jail for fraud. They had been struck off as a solicitor mm. and they had appeared and they were trying to buy some commercial property and it was a fraud. They had the, the documents were all flagging up. It was like <laughs> uh, all the red flags. Yeah, yeah, shit. Like, don't, don't go ahead. <laughs> and then um, the law firm were like, are you sure? We're like, yeah, for sure. Like, don't like you should stop. Like, and the there's a process to follow up when that happens. Like, so that the National Crime Association, or National Crime Agency in the UK is like a a, is a bit like maybe the FBI. It's like an equivalent of that. Okay. And if this was to happen, you would need to submit a suspicious activity report to them. But prior to that, you would need to talk to the supervisory authority which in scotland is the law society so they would be obliged to then say hey this has popped up and um, this is quite unusual we should submit this to the uh, the the nca so national crime agency and say look there's been this suspicious activity and when you put that in you, you could have a defense against um money laundering sar so that's known as a damo sar and the idea would be you put in this information you submit it to the feds and they would come back and say either okay this is a, a criminal that we're aware of and we're tracking them there's a live investigation just go ahead and do nothing just you know go ahead don't intervene but more you know that that is one outcome but the other outcome is okay you don't go ahead but I would say 99.9 .9 times out of 100, the risk and compliance officers in that law firm, as soon as that would come in, would be like, sorry, we, we can't deal with you. And then at that point, they're going to then shop around and try and find other lawyers who maybe don't use an online system to, that would flag that stuff. So when it came in, it was like news articles about this person who had been you know, thrown off the register and they had been put in jail. So it was very obvious that you know, this was a challenge, the, the chances of that happening are very, very slim. But, you know, it does happen now and again. 
now and again. Interesting. That, but that's that's fascinating how and I like that you in telling that story were able to tell us the only way you were able to access any of that information was by your customer saying, yeah. you know, opening that. I, it's important to say that. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Important to share that. Uh, where do you see what, where do you see growth for your company uh, in the future? Uh, do you do you see it beyond the AML KYC, the identity check, the kind of that stuff, or are you looking to to grow beyond that space? Yeah, yeah, we, we're doing quite a few different things. There's a, a project we've got on at the moment with Glasgow University, and that's around succession law. So if you're going through a bereavement, and what do you do to deal with a will and all of that side mm-hmm. of things? So in Scotland, about the stats are about 60% of people don't have a will. Mm. They just oh, have wow. never engaged to do that. So it's a, like Scotland isn't very big. There's maybe only like 5 million people here. So probably the state that you're in might be bigger than that. Mm. Um, but of that number, there's a huge proportion of people who don't have a will. And when it comes to the process, um, it's called confirmation. When you need to go to court and say, oh, yeah, this person has died and I'm going to be taking care of the estate. There's a very low number of people who go through that process. So at the moment, the challenge there is not a lot of people would know where to go or find out what happens there. So in this project that we're working on right now, we've got these experts from the university who've been involved in reform of this law for over a decade. And their thinking was, could you map the process? Could you create some sort of calculator to help people understand their situation? And we said, yeah, sure, you could use that. You could get some sort of logic and a decision tree. You could take the input you know, from our previous experience. We know that we could do that type of stuff. Um, and the, the next step from that would be working with government um, through the project to say, yeah, you could do this and then you could create a fully digital end-to-end process where you could confirm an estate and you could do that online but to do that the enabling technologies are digital identity and then digital signatures so right now in Scotland if you're going to sign something you can use an AES like DocuSign or you can Mm -hmm. use um, EchoSign but if you're going to sign a trust a deed or something that's like an elevated level of authentication you need to use a qualified electronic signature. So a QES is, is mm-hmm. harder to manage and go through that process. But what we've been talking in that example is like how we can join up what we already do. Like we already like digital identity and all the anti-money laundering and anti-fraud stuff is our day-to-day. So we're there already. But That's how right. can we take how can we take what we already do and apply that to other areas of the law? to make things simple for people to then have a fully joined up end-to-end process. So succession law and dealing with, you know, wills and private client like estate work is is a good example of how we could, you know, radically change that. So if you took it a step further, the idea would be effectively a, a tool or a widget that could be embedded on a law firm's website to say, oh, hey, Nick, um, do you know what's what would happen if you died and well, where would your stuff go with your family? You can put in some really straightforward information and we can then signpost you on to the next steps. Very cool. Very cool. And so you've had, uh, you've been an entrepreneur for quite some time. It, it sounds like you were in 2008 when you had, uh, what, what, when was Amicus born for you? And I, I'd like to, we always like to, for the startup, uh, for the startup folks, we want to know, you know, some obstacles that you faced uh, and then maybe some successes that you've had. Yeah, um, it's probably, we set it up, like actually incorporated the company would be July six years ago. Okay. Um, and we we bootstrapped it to start with. Uh, there was a, a friend who is at Facebook as a, a product designer. We had a couple of engineers, someone who was in infrastructure, like uh, server side security. Um, and our accountant. So when we set up, there were five co-founders, okay. uh, which is unusual. Everyone said, oh, that will never work. Um, that's okay so far. <laughs> um, and uh, we just recognized that we would need a, a quite a broad set of expertise to be able to do or set out to do what we wanted. And they were all working in their roles, like different jobs. And I'd say, right, well, I'll, I'll kick it off and then we'll allocate some shares to each person and then they would need to trust that I would 
you know, bring in other investment, get the business going. So that's how we got started. Um, I guess things along the way, like we were fortunate in, in Scotland, there's it's quite a, a strong angel investment community. So Good. it's really easy to get like a cut a check for a couple of hundred K that type of thing. Um, and then that can be matched by other funding. So we went through a couple of rounds and did that type of stuff. Uh, got a product to market. It took us maybe 18 months to get the product to market. We spent okay. maybe six months on the first thing before we realized <laughs> we're going to have to start generating revenue. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and then from then, we we started to win different clients and you know move things forward and recognize that we wanted to build a sustainable business and high growth. And then over, I guess, once we were on the market, we each year we've, uh, we've doubled revenue each year for the last three years and then this year we've tripled so wow. we've been once we kind of got that initial product market fit we recognized there was lots of use cases that we could apply this to um, and it's all usage based so people once they get started they like it they use it more we add more functionality they pay more for the more functionality and um, each year about 60 percent of our revenue comes from a previous cohort of business. So mm -hmm. if someone came to us from a previous year, the coming year, 60% of the revenue of that year comes from the existing client base. So we've been able to build a product that people love, the you know, a high net promoter score, really simple to use. And there's just such a really obvious use case for it. And yeah. And how about obstacles that you faced in there? Anything that you felt like was just blew you away and and over that you weren't sure you were going to overcome and how'd you overcome it yeah like every day every week <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i wonder what like what big obstacles like i guess when we first came out to talk to the law society you know i rocked up and the previous business had failed i went i trained as a mediator uh -huh. so i was working as a civil and commercial mediator and you know did some workplace and employment work so I kind of rocked up and said, yeah, we're going to build this thing where we tell people all about not going to court and how can you solve problems without going to court? And they were like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And I said, well, do you know what? We need to solve the onboarding problem. If we can fix that and do that to a really high standard, it's going to help law firms acquire new clients and they'll work digitally. And they're like, yeah, cool. Come back and see us maybe in a year or two. <laughs> And initially, when, when we were going out to talk to law firms, they were all like, yeah, my client's never going to do this. Like, I've got 70 or 80-year-old people who no one will ever do this. So we were always, you know, pushing against that. And then from a risk and compliance perspective, it was, you're a tiny company. Why the hell would we let you deal with this stuff? So there were various things along the way, but I think we were just persistent and recognized that yeah, you're going to get a closed door a number of times. But once we were able to start having that social proof to evidence that, okay, actually, this is great. This is a really good experience for your client. And actually, we can help law firms to work in this more dynamic way. Then there was a competitive advantage to be won. So um, I guess once we did get those first few over the line, that, that, was, that was really positive. I'm trying to think there's probably been so many there's been a lot of close calls with you know from a funding perspective of oh yeah we need to get this money in the door the salary checks are going out the next again week and you're like oh shit no the cash yeah. flow issues yeah yeah just the cash flow and like dealing with that side of things so we've we've been through that a few times um and it's always knowing you'll figure something out it, it'll always come right one of the one of the big pushes has been about getting to a sustainable point. So mm -hmm. not having people burn out, not, you know, being in that position again, where you're thinking, oh no, there's really only a few weeks worth of runway left. So we've been very mindful of that. I guess COVID was a big hit when that mm -hmm. kicked off and everything just shut down overnight. Like the whole of the legal profession was like shut. Everything just stopped. You know, everyone was, you know, thinking, oh, no, well, everyone's going to go and furlough. What's going to happen? So we we just made the call to say that we would just pause subscriptions for all of our clients. We went out to them all and said, look, we know that you're not going to be using our stuff. We've got loads to do. Um, 
So let's just have a chat. If, you know, when you need us, we'll be here. So we went out and put that message back to the board and our investors and just said, look, this just doesn't make any sense. Um, they, there was some discussion about you, all the teams should be furloughed. And um, so like put them off, like, you know, we mm -hmm. don't need everyone anymore. But we knew that there was so much to go after. And as soon as things turned around, it would be really big. So we said, no, you know, the right thing to do here is to press on. And we looked at what other opportunities there were. And, and that's where our opportunity with the NHS came up. They, so mm -hmm. they manage, like, it's basically state-based healthcare. Healthcare, yeah. Um, yeah. So they've got this scenario where they needed to bring in hundreds of thousands of people who had maybe retired recently to come back and support and get in and quickly. But if you're going to go and work in a hospital with kids and or vulnerable adults, you need to go through the vetting process, the pre-employment yeah. check. So yeah. we were able to say, okay, well, all of our law firm clients, they have just switched off overnight. So there was a huge dip in revenue. And then we, we kind of refocused and said, well, what other areas do really need this? And we were able to do that at cost and get things going with the NHS. And we've now got um, a really good relationship there. So I guess for many businesses, COVID was like a, a really challenging time and mm -hmm. for everyone's families and, you know, the, the overall situation. But in the end, it, it worked out um, and we were able to move forward with that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that's you really that that's really entrepreneurial. You pivoted it and said, "Who else can we assist?" and go out and find those contracts. That's fantastic. I don't want to keep you. I know how late it is over there. Um, anything that we haven't covered about you, about the company that we should cover? Anything that you want to say that you haven't said yet? Um. I don't think so. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. It's it's, it's always interesting to talk and, and share a bit about the story and, you know, how we've got to where we're going. And I guess for us, it's really looking forward to thinking what we've achieved is, is really based in the UK. We've got maybe a couple of clients in the US, a couple of attorneys in Ohio randomly. don't know oh, why. Wow. Um, I think via Clio. Um, but yeah, I guess for us thinking, uh, I guess if there's anyone who's thinking they need to look at this stuff and as and when the compliance scenario changes uh, in North America, then it's really something for us to be thinking about uh, yeah. coming across and seeing how we can um, do more via Clio and go out and support more firms, really. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. So if you're, uh, uh, and we do have a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, lawyers who listen to the podcast, especially, and uh, so if you're looking for uh, compliance uh, and risk and uh, background checks and uh, in identity verification, uh, reach out to Amicus. Oh, yeah. And tell us where they find you. Yeah. Um, we're at amicus.co. Uh, I realize there's a couple of Amicus different companies in the U.S., but we are amiqus.co. Dot co. So that's, uh, uh, you can find them at amicus, A-M-I-Q-U-S dot C-O. That's the website. Uh, I also believe it's as, it's on Twitter at A-M-I-Q-U-S. They've got that without the co on there. So, uh, and if they want to contact you, is there, a, a, you don't have to give your direct email, but if you have a, an inquiries email or something, that would, you yeah, can share that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and if anyone's got any stuff that comes to mind they think might be relevant, the best one would be labs at amicus.co. Okay, labs, L-A-B-S at yep. amicus.co. Excellent. Yep. Colm, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you taking the time in, in your uh, middle of your evening to <laughs> come on the show and share with us. Uh, and I will uh, have you maybe come back in a year uh, reach out if you have a, have something big happening or an announcement you want to make and let's see how things are going in a year or so. Yeah, cool. That's great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. No, oh, thank you. And we will be back next week, folks, with Patrick Hall. Patrick Hall is one of two co-founders of BNH.AI. It is a law firm registered in D.C., which allows them to have a non-lawyer ownership. So they are both a data science firm 
and a law firm combined. So stay tuned for that next week. Uh, we will be back then. Thanks again, Callum. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Nick.